Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, I just wanted to say I love to cry. You know, I was brought up not to cry. And then as an adult, I found this wonderful facility that I, I quite actually felt good about practicing sometimes. And I've cried this morning. Who couldn't of hearing some of the stuff we've heard? Congratulations, everybody, for arranging this conference. How wonderful to get all these people in the room trying to make the future safer. Thank you for the invitation. I also want to acknowledge that whenever there's a gathering of this many people, there will be loads of trauma histories, sad histories that we don't know about because people haven't necessarily revealed them. So I just want to acknowledge those sad histories that will be throughout this room, as well as happy histories, of course, but you know what I mean. And I also want to say thank you for all the work you do. I think that's really, really important. In 2001, my brother and close, closest friend, uh, Bill, took his own life from depression. And, you know, I don't think we had a clue how to properly grieve that before my sister and nephew were murdered uh, by the husband for, uh, in domestic violence. He then took his own life. But it galvanized me in a way that I can't really articulate, but I felt so imbued with a spirit of wanting to do something. And one of the most impactful things on me was the way my family was treated, especially after the murders. And I couldn't understand why we were being treated as troublemakers when we wanted to understand things, get answers, and make change. And so it took my family a five-year campaign after the murders to bring about the first ever domestic homicide review piloted in the light of how they might be several years later. I then started advocacy after fatal domestic abuse in 2008. Prior to that, I was working at Nationwide Building Society but I really I was running my family's domestic homicide review. So if any of your mortgages shot up in those years, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I wasn't that senior, so even if I was uh, copping out a bit on my work, I don't think it would have had that effect. But they were very supportive of me, you know. But in 2008, I left and started advocacy after fatal domestic abuse. And I wanted to give people the belief that in a liberal democracy, it is okay to challenge authority, but you have to do it civilly. You have to do it with good arguments, and you have to do it with persistence, and you will get somewhere with those attributes. It was so important that I helped people understand that, because the professionals are okay with that, you know? We started uh, a domestic homicide review model many years later, but just going back to 2008 when we started after, we began by advocating for families. At, those, at that time, we didn't know much about suicide. So when it came up with the name advocacy after fatal domestic abuse, people mocked me that it was a bit clumsy. And it was clumsy. I don't have a marketing background. But years later, I suddenly thought, it wasn't a bad title, you know. Because we started to realize there was all these deaths, not homicide. Suicide, which you know actually can be called homicide in some cases, will come on to, but you know neglect, hypothermia, AIDS, collaterals, all linked to domestic abuse. So we provide that advocacy for families to empower them, to help them with their status, and we set up a unit specifically to help children. Professor Marilyn R. Moore, who I met in America, said, Frank, we teach children that the correct response to trauma is silence. We teach them that. And then we wonder why they might behave strangely afterwards. Or in fact, not strangely, but quite appropriately is another way of looking at it. So I am determined to help children contribute to the review process and that they get the proper trauma therapy. The stock responses don't include the children. It might traumatize them. 
How many children are traumatized because we ignore them? Nobody is measuring that. And as Jeannie said earlier, how many suicides of children do we know are properly linked to domestic abuse? We have international influence. I've been to America five times to study their reviews and to bring our education to them. I've helped Portugal uh, input domestic homicide reviews, and I'm linked to many other countries on the development of this, and they're looking at our model. And Professor Neil Websdale, probably the world guru on these kind of reviews, says that the British domestic homicide reviews are the best in the world because of their rich detail. This is wonderful. This is raising the status of people suffering domestic abuse. Yes, we have to spend money as a society reviewing these homicides and suicides, and we have to understand why they happen and stop them happening in the future. I'm also a reader, as is Sarah. Um, I was appointed way back in 2011. The domestic homicide reviews come to Sarah and me and some other people first as part of the QA process, and we have to give a detailed analysis. I've read over 1,100 domestic homicide reviews. I don't get invited to many dinner parties. <laughs> it's not because of the domestic homicide reviews. It's when they find out I used to be an accountant. That's the real one. We also provide the national... Uh, give me a dinner party invitation. We'll talk about something else. We provide national accredited training for chairs of domestic homicide reviews. I am a Home Office accredited chair. God, I forgot about the slides. <laughs> We've done that one. Whoops, we're on to this one now. Alain de Bartin. I bet you never heard of him from that pronunciation. I think he's a Swiss philosopher. And he said that people with low status are all but invisible. They are treated brusquely. They get their complexities trampled upon and they get their singularities ignored. I've done that to people, I'm sure, down the years, especially when I was younger and sick and stupid and arrogant and cocky. I bet I've, am I the only one in the room who's done that? Shame on me if I am. I doubt it somehow. Niles Christie, Norwegian criminologist, came up with the ideal victim in society. It is female, she is female. She must be old or young, not in the middle but she must be killed by someone who is unambiguously big and bad. She must have no black marks. She can't have indulged in sex work. She can't have touched drugs because they relegate her even further. And get this one, she must not threaten any established interests in her victimhood. How interesting that is. I then had the privilege of authoring a book with Professor Jane Munton Smith and Amanda Williams in which our research showed that women cohabit killed by a cohabiting partner or a uh, intimate partner, their status as a victim of homicide is down there, as you all know. But that is the status. So I decided that status attracts resources, actually. And we started to build our domestic homicide review model practicing after, and had great help from Sarah Danger, to raise the status of four parties. Number one, the deceased. Let's get the story accurately told so that we learn from something that did happen. Because it would be madness, wouldn't it, to learn from fiction. The second party that we had to raise the status of was families and friends. Help them be treated integrally, not involved, because that ain't enough, integrally. That means key stakeholder status. Be treated with respect. The third party is the professionals. We've got to take blame out of these reviews. I have witnessed blame of professionals by it, their own organizations, and I don't like it. Sometimes it mimics the behaviors in domestic abuse the strong on the less powerful sometimes. I'm against blame for three reasons, really. Number one, as an advocate, 
The families want information. If I start blaming, the shutters go up and they conceal stuff. But secondly, it's unjust. I actually believe in justice. And if I only believe in justice for my family and me and other families, I'm a first-class bullshitter, am I not? If I believe in justice, it has to be for everyone. Exactly as Sarah said about trauma informed for everyone. So that's the second reason that I'm against blame, because it's unjust. But the third reason is it's an illusion that the world was made safer by just sacking people, because there is re-recruitment into the same system. I come from a systems background. It's going to happen again. So we have to take blame out. And I want to get to a kind of review environment in which the young police officer or social worker jumps out of bed the morning of a domestic homicide review and says, yippee, today I've been freed up to admit my weaknesses and frustrations, to disclose to the review what it was like trying to prevent this homicide the trouble I'm having with supervision, which is absent, the bullying, this, that, or the other, the lack of training, the stuff I don't understand. You're actually asking me to be honest. Because everybody tells me that 99% of professionals are trying to do a good job. I believe that. So let's emancipate them to do that good job. And even better than that, let's invite them for their creative ideas of how to make the world safer. That seems to me to be a much better use of resources than a historic, traditional kind of review in which people come in, very defensive, put the shutters up, get a bit beaten up, and we move on. And the public is told that the world is safer. I'm, I just don't buy that. Now, you can say, Frank, that's a bit idealistic. And I'd say, you're wrong. It's very idealistic. <laughs> and it's very difficult. But I believe in big aspirations. Because how are we going to get anywhere without a decent aspiration? I want to move towards that. It is a myth that all families want to lay blame. It is a myth. Some of them do. Some of them use language that sounds like blame. But get behind it, and that's what our advocates do. It is the language of frustration, of lack of understanding, of needing information. I have seen families hug professionals who on the face of it look like they made terrible mistakes. There is understanding and humanity when we give people respect. So that's the model that I really want to try and build. Preventing suicide. I don't know enough about this, but it seems to me that we have to show people that might want to take their lives, a better offer, a better alternative. I think of this in terms of domestic abuse. When a police force go to a, a woman and say, I want you to pursue a prosecution, she's thinking possibly, you ain't trumped what I know the perpetrator is going to do when he gets out of jail. You haven't trumped it yet. Your offer to me is not compelling enough. I'm going to reject it. And then sometimes Sarah and me will see in the review, she was reckless. reckless. She did not accept our advice. Some people are still alive because they rejected uh, unsafe advice. So we have to be able to be confident. And I don't know enough about this yet, but I bet there are people that know more than me on this. We have to somehow be able to describe better futures that people can believe in. Where my strength is, I think, can be held in reviews and inquests, because we want them to be so effective that they are a loop back into prevention. We are beginning to illuminate the past to make the future safer, to shine a light. And that's not a 40-watt light bulb, no offence to the Greens. That is a floodlight. And that means going to do it properly. And it means not only turning the stones over, but kicking them 40 yards away and really looking at it. Inviting everybody in, being respectful to everybody, adult mature reviewing, in which we are committed to revealing what we really see and trying to make that future safer. Coroners, so different, postcode lottery, just beginning to change. Our advocates write to coroners and say, please don't start this suicide inquest until the domestic homicide review has made findings. This is with the family's agreement because domestic homicide reviews are revealing the richness of trails of abuse, which can help the coroner, like 
she did in the Jesse Laverick case make the first significant inquest in which they linked domestic abuse to Jesse's death. And then it went further with Kelly Sutton, where the coroner ruled that Kelly, who took the actions that ended her own life, but it was in fact an unlawful killing. I'll explain a bit more about that shortly. I want to educate the community because I hear such horrors in the community about suicide. And I'm just going to mention that when I finish. Thank you, Sarah, for mentioning the great research that Sarah, Vanessa Munro, and Lottie, I forget Lottie's surname for a second, did. Young Strada. Young Strada. Young Andrada. Young Andrada. Lottie Young Andrada, Sarah Danger, and Vanessa Munro, the learning legacies. Um, which produced so many findings, including that, sadly, police investigations to suicide are not giving enough appropriate status to these people, and criminality is going unchecked. I have written to the minister about this. I keep meeting Louisa Rolf about it, I, who's the national lead on domestic violence to the National Police Chiefs, national police Chiefs Council, uh, and we will continue to do that. Anybody heard of this Supreme Court judgment? It lowered, it lowered the threshold of proof that a coroner can use to find unlawful killing. And that's why Kelly Sutton's inquest was that. So James Morn was found dead in custody uh, four or five years ago. His, uh, the, the jury of the inquest said he took his own life. The family said, you're not allowed to say that, except to the criminal standard. They did it on the balance of probability. The family judicially reviewed the coroner. The court said, well, technically the family's right, but actually we've been wrong for 800 years. And you can say on the balance of probability that it was a suicide. We then tried to intervene with the Supreme Court because now we have a problem. We have suicides at one level and unlawful killing at another, which means I can kill someone, dress it up as a suicide, and get it uh, passed away on the, on the lower standard of proof. And the Supreme Court did the right thing now, it did not feel lovely to say that. I'm not a lawyer. Imagine saying the Supreme Court, who am I to say that while I'm saying it? No Supreme Court judges in the room? Might be a few lawyers. <laughs> so they surely did the right thing, and they lowered the hot. So you had to have them at the same level. So now we're going to see this more and more in inquests, I think. Certainly families are going to represent this. This is an unlawful killing. Now, whether it will lead to convictions for manslaughter is another question because that's at the highest standard of, of proof. But we already have Nicholas Allen in jail for manslaughter because of Justine Reese's suicide, and we have people in for coercive control. I'm not going to sanitize what I'm about to say next, and I make no apology for it. I want to educate community. Somebody came up to me at my brother's funeral and said, your brother was a coward astonishingly not educated. I have heard at a funeral, or said about a funeral, sorry, of a woman who took her own life, leaving two children behind because of domestic abuse, the selfish bitch. Now, while those beliefs are in society, we've got a problem. Stigma is a killer, no doubt about it. And I define stigma, personally, if you feel stigma about something, it's as if you imagine others saying, you should perceive that we think less of you. And that, to me, is what stigma feels like. So let's kick stigma down the path. I'm going to give you two minutes back because I'm finished. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> <laughs>